Hello, I'm Tom Kimmel, Director Cote. Thank you for the sixth time for that effusive, inflated, hyperbolic introduction that I provided for you. Stay with me, folks, and I promise you some facts you have never heard before, some free stuff, and finally, some fun along the way. After all, it's my job to talk today and your job to listen, should you finish before I do. Well, then God bless you. The Pearl Harbor story boils down to almost everyone in Washington, D.C. versus the Hawaiian Command, Admiral Kimmel and General Short. The important exception is Captain Lawrence Safford the head of Naval Communications Intelligence in Washington, D.C., who dared to tell the truth, and without whom there is no Pearl Harbor story as we know it today. Notwithstanding the proceeding, the Pearl Harbor story today still boils down to Washington versus Kimmel and Short. Okay, this is the sixth class for today, sixth and final. Advanced knowledge indications. I do not subscribe to the theory that there was advanced knowledge, but that does not mean that I'm ignorant as to the indications thereof. This would be advanced knowledge of the Pearl Harbor attack. Before we get into the heart of the matter, however, it's time for some fun. Some of that fun I promised you earlier. Consider my fourth great-grandfather, Herman Husband, was actually accused of failing to prevent the Revolutionary War and the Whiskey Rebellion. That's actually better than my grandfather, who was merely accused of failing to prevent World War II, and the Cold War. That accusation was made from the well of the House of Representatives. If you think that's bizarre, consider Senator Collins' handling of a British-Australian maritime fiasco. Ladies and gentlemen, John Clark and Brian Daw. So, I was thanks for coming in. Thanks, Brad. Thank you. The ship that was involved in the incident off Western Australia this week, yeah, the one in front fell off. Yeah. yeah, that's not very typical. I'd like to make that point. Well, how is it untypical? Well, there are a lot of these ships going around the world all the time, and very seldom does anything like this happen. I just don't want people thinking that tankers aren't safe. Is this tanker safe? Well, I was thinking more about the other ones. The ones that are safe? Yeah, the ones at the front that didn't fall off. Well, if this wasn't safe, why did this have 80,000 tons of oil on it? I'm not saying it wasn't safe. It's just perhaps not quite as safe as some of the other ones. Why? Well, some of them built so the front doesn't fall off at all. You know, isn't the so the front wouldn't fall off? Well, obviously not. How do you know? Well, if the front fell off, and 20,000 tons of crude oil spilled in the sea caught fire. It's a bit of a giveaway. I just like to make the point that that is not normal. Well, what sort of standards would be for the oil tankers group? Oh, well, very rigorous maritime engineering standards. What sort of thing? Well, the front's not supposed to fall off for a start. You know what I so? Well, there are uh, regulations governing the uh, materials that they can be made of. Well, I'm sure it's all cardboard's out. Yeah, then, no cardboard derivatives. Like paper? No paper. No spring, no cell pack, rubber. No, grab it out. Um, they've got to have a steering wheel. There's a minimum crew requirement. What's the minimum crew? Oh, why not, I suppose. So the allegations that we're just designed to carry as much oil as possible, uh, are there any consequences? I mean, that's sort of absolutely ludicrous. These are very, very strong vessels. So what happened in this case? Well, the front fell off in this case, by all means, but very unusual. This is a cause why the front would fall off. A wave hit it. A wave hit it? A wave hit the ship. Is that unusual? Oh, yeah. But see, Absolutely. So we just protect the environment. Well, it's like the ship was towed outside the environment. Is it not an environment? No, no, it's been towed beyond the environment. It's not in the environment. No, it's not environment, it's another environment. No, it's beyond the environment. It's not in the environment. It could have been towed yeah. beyond the environment. Well, what's out there? Nothing's out there. There must be something. There is nothing out there. All there is is sea and birds and fish. And? And 20,000 tons of crude oil. And what else? And a fire. And anything else? And the part of the ship that the front fell off. But there's nothing else out there. Senator Collins asked you in the leap void. Yeah. Well, it's an environment perfectly safe for us, huh? So, with that in mind, 
we proceed. Indications of advanced knowledge. We'll start with the German ambassador in Washington, Dr. Hans Thompson. The uh, coordinator of information, William Donovan, tried mightily to use the German ambassador as a source. And starting about July 1940, Donovan's agent, Malcolm R. Lovell, and Donovan, and Thompson, engaged in an intrigue to overthrow Hitler and seize the power of the German state while the United States was still neutral in the war. Lovell claimed later that Thompson warned him appreciably before the Pearl Harbor attack that the Japanese intended to attack the United States at Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> Director of Central Intelligence William Casey, during the Reagan administration, wrote a book called The Secret War Against Hitler. He wrote it in 1988, and on page 7 he had this intriguing sentence. The British had sent word that a Japanese fleet was steaming east toward Hawaii. Unfortunately, Mr. Casey deceased shortly after publication of that book, so we were never able to follow up on that remarkable sentence. MI6 can think of it as the British CIA, the head of the Joint Intelligence Committee for MI6. The chairman was Victor Cavendish Bentnick, Bentink. He apparently is credited with saying that we, the Joint Intelligence Committee, knew that the Japanese fleet had changed course by Friday, December 5th, 1941. I remember presiding over a JIC meeting and being told that a Japanese fleet was sailing in the direction of Hawaii, asking, have we informed our transatlantic brethren and receiving an affirmative reply? This was followed up by a member of the JIC, Joint Intelligence Committee, Sir Julian Rigsdale, recalling a JIC meeting in which radio silence adopted by the Japanese fleet was discussed and its possible destinations reviewed. Pearl Harbor was one of the targets thought most likely, and as a result, a warning telegram was dispatched to Washington. Ridgedale met with Bentink and confirmed that a warning telegram had been dispatched. Morton Seymour had much to do with a Canadian, the Canadian Air Force. In an affidavit, he said, on December 1st, 1941, Joseph Appadale, who was a staff member of the Canadian Department of National Defense for Air, informed me, Seymour, that British military intelligence had informed Ottawa that it was suspected that the Japanese would make a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor on December 8, 1941, and asked me what was the earliest date that we could hold a special meeting of the board of directors of the association. <clears throat> the 14th Prime Minister of Canada, 1963-68, Lester B. Pearson weighed in in a letter to Seymour, in which the Prime Minister said, British military intelligence had informed Ottawa that the Japanese would attack Pearl Harbor on December 8th, which, because of the international dateline, turned out to be December 7th. Certainly J. Edgar Hoover <coughs> thought he had a bombshell, which he did, <clears throat> when the head of counterintelligence for the Army in Washington, D.C., Colonel John Terbush Bissell, secretly informed FBI Special Agent George Burton in the strictest of confidence and with the statement that if ever got out that he had disclosed this information, he would be fired. But about 10 days before the attack, Japanese intercepts 
substantially revealed the complete plans for the attack on Pearl Harbor. They also contained a code word. This code word was intercepted, intercepted, which indicated that the attack would be on either Saturday or Sunday. And supposedly all this information was sent to Hawaii. The reason the FBI thought that this was so important, and I guess first of all I should tell you, I wrote about this uh, matter uh, in the Association of Former Intelligence Officers journal, and uh, obviously it was published. I can get you a copy if you want it. At any rate, we continue on. <clears throat> Let's go pop off. In August of 1941, a German military intelligence spy operated by MI5, MI6, and the FBI provided an ABOR, German military intelligence questionnaire. This is the questionnaire before you. Among other things, the questionnaire was seeking information about the Naval Strong Point Pearl Harbor. They wanted to know the depths of water at Pearl Harbor and they wanted to know whether torpedo protection nets were being used. All of this becomes particularly interesting because FBI agent George C. Burton was actually working with John Terbush Bissell on the pop-off matter and obviously other counterintelligence matters. So when Bissell secretly came forward to the FBI, the FBI had every reason in the world to believe what Bissell was saying. And that's why they took Bissell's information, which uh, was received four days after the Pearl Harbor attack. That day and the next day, they sent it to President Roosevelt. And five days after that, they sent it in two letters to the uh, chairman of the Roberts Commission, uh, Owen Roberts, a sitting Supreme Court Associate Justice. <clears throat> Again, here is the uh, bombshell information that was received by the FBI from John Terbush Bissell. <clears throat> Another German uh, Abor agent, Ulrich von der Osten, was uh, killed in Times Square in March of 1941. <clears throat> After a search, it was found that he had been on a spy mission to Hawaii to report on defenses at Pearl Harbor. And he actually wrote in his own hand in cursive, this report will be of interest mostly to our yellow allies. I wrote about that in something called the American Intelligence Journal in 2009. Sir William Stevenson was the man that Prime Minister Churchill sent to the United States to do what he could about uh, getting the United States into the war. Stevenson talking about Popoff's questionnaire, said he found the Popoff questionnaire striking. It requested harbor depths at Pearl Harbor soon after the Toronto attack. The Toronto attack was November, uh, November 11, 1940, or November 1940 at any rate, <clears throat> in which the uh, British aircraft carrier sank battleships in the Italian port of Toronto, Italian battleships by dropping, uh, air, air dropping torpedoes, which obviously were capable of running in shallow water. <clears throat> Stevenson's biographer, also named Stevenson, but with a different spelling, wrote this conversation <clears throat> with spy Stevenson was not for publication at the time. But Spy Stevenson was very clear. He said Popoff has indeed met J. Edgar Hoover. He thought that the FBI had totally failed to pick up on what Popoff was trying to tell them about Pearl Harbor. William Stevenson's secretary 
she weighed in eventually and said we did know that they, the Japanese, were going to attack on December 7th. We told London. We told the Americans. We had quite some considerable warning. And, of course, Stevenson himself was Canadian, as was apparently his secretary. <clears throat> In a 1975 oral history project by the University of Hawaii, the uh, former governor of Hawaii, John Burns, was interviewed, but at the time of the Pearl Harbor attack, he was the head of the Honolulu Police Department Espionage Bureau. <clears throat> and he laid out this conversation he had with the head of the FBI in, in Honolulu, Robert Shivers. A week before the attack, Shivers told Burns, I'm not telling my men this, but I'm telling you, we're going to be attacked before the week is out. Shivers, a month after the attack, told Burns, you will be one of the ones to be called before the Roberts Commission. What are you going to tell them? Burns, who at the time was the head of the Honolulu Police Department Espionage Bureau, said the truth. I'm going to tell them the truth. Shivers came back. You really going to tell them the truth? Burns, exactly the truth. Yes, sir, including what you told me. <clears throat> this one speaks for itself, although it's a rather famous part of the Pearl Harbor story, because on November 30th, the Honolulu Advertiser actually had this headline, Japanese may strike over the weekend. Investigators for decades tried to determine where in the world this newspaper got this notion, got this article. Well, somebody stepped forward <coughs> and tried to explain it. A fellow named Joseph Lieb. Joe Lieb had influential contacts in Roosevelt's administration. Cornell Hall was secondary state. And he called me on Saturday morning around 9.30, asked if I could come over to see him. I came over, well, didn't live far from there, and he met me out in front of the State Department, the old State Department. And we were walking towards the White House. And he mentioned that he had something very important to talk to. And we wanted to sit down. We walked across the street to Lafayette Park, sat on the bench, and he started to relate that Pearl Harbor would be attacked on December the 7th. Specifically, he emphasized December the 7th, and that he wanted me to know because I had helped him on other issues, that if anything should erupt against him, that uh, he would be protected by a friend, which I have been to him. And uh, he then related to pull out of his pocket the, the transcript, which stated specifically that Pearl Harbor would be attacked on December the 7th. Lee did his exclusive to the United Press and put it only on the foreign wire. Ironically, the only paper to use it was the Honolulu Advertiser. <clears throat> Another uh, very interesting, controversial <clears throat> matter was the Dutch naval attaché, Johan Ranus diary. In the diary, purportedly, on December 2nd, <clears throat> 1941, was this language. Conference at Navy Department. They show me on the map the location of two Japanese carriers departed from Japan on easterly course. On December 6, 1941, there's this entry. At 1400, which is 2 p.m., two Navy Department. Everyone present at the Office of Naval Intelligence confer. Director Admiral Wilkinson, who was the head of ONI, Captain McCallum, who was the head of the Far East section of ONI, and Lieutenant Commander Kramer, a codebreaker courier, 
at my request, they show me the location of the two Japanese carriers west of Honolulu. Much has been made of this, and it is highly controversial. <clears throat> Next item. General Elliot Thorpe was our military observer in Java at the time. He later wrote a book, and in the book, called East Wind Rain, the intimate account of an intelligence officer in the Pacific from 1939 to 1949, he wrote, I suppose the most important thing I ever did as an Army intelligence officer was to notify Washington of the forthcoming attack on Pearl Harbor. <clears throat> Doesn't get much more direct than that, does it? Important, we feel the threat of the Japanese fleet to the American liaison officer, Brigadier General Elliot Thorpe. He told Thorpe Pearl Harbor was one of four possible targets. John DeFord McClellan of the Dutch Army. What is sure about him and his two armies? Well, I, I really had sent him a message. So he said, I got a copy of the same message. I said it to me, what did I have to say at the Dutch Embassy in Washington? And Colonel Wyman, who was a Dutch out of in Washington, realized how important it was. So he took it in person to General George Marshall, who was then chief of staff of the army. And Marshall read, read this in the sun and turned to Wyman and said, do you expect me to believe this stuff? So that was a little odd. <coughs> and I sent three more dispersely. And finally I got a cable back saying, don't send us anymore. We're not interested. Next up is Lieutenant, Com Lieutenant Colonel William Henlick of the United States Army. There was nowhere to be found. Colonel Rufus Bratton was responsible for keeping Marshall supplied with such vital information. So Bratton, Marshall's sudden unavailability at a time when America was on the brink of war could not have been accidental. Colonel William Heinrich, a fellow officer, heard directly of Bratton's frustration. Colonel James Compton told me what I'm about to tell you, and I later heard it from Colonel Bratton himself. On the morning of December 7th, 1941, Colonel Bratton called Compton at his home and asked him to come immediately to his Bratton's office. As he came in the office at about six o'clock, he found a relaxed Bratton seated at his desk with his feet up on it. And he said, Jimmy, come in. They're going to lower the boom on us, and I need a witness. Colonel Compton seated himself, and Bratton made his first call to the Chief of Staff. His aim, of course, was to tell the Chief of Staff that, in his opinion, the intercepts and the information which he had available showed clearly that the Japanese were about to attack. He continued to call for the next several hours. Each time, the person taking the call reported to Bratton that General Marshall, the Chief of Staff, was out riding, each time out riding. And finally, in disgust, Bratton turned to Compton and said, Jimmy, I'm going to make this the most famous horseback ride since Paul Revere. Marshall eventually arrived. Lieutenant Commander Robert Danforth Ogg is up next. Uh, beginning December 2nd, which I believe was Tuesday, and probably Tuesday afternoon, Hosmer came running in with some data here and said, let's look where this is and something that just, I don't think I could have plotted fast enough as to where that might be. And uh, and then uh, from there on the next few days, it was very exciting. Each time he, he brought some new data to me and said, here's another reference and another reference and they began to line across the Pacific going from the west to the east and beginning and our first plot were just east of the international bank line. The White House was known to be one of the places where Hosmer's work was sent. 
The man who sent out the information was Captain Richard McCullough, chief of the 12th Naval District based in San Francisco. From Saturday, I went in without a lot of plot of the information that I had, and I was excited enough about finding the fleet was 500 miles north of the Long Island uh, to drive to his home uh, that Saturday afternoon and uh, tell him. Colonel Sadler. Colonel Sadler was the head of uh, Army Communications Intelligence. He actually uh, was so concerned about what he had learned from intelligence that he wanted to send this message uh, to uh, Hawaii. Reliable information indicates war with Japan in the very near future. Take every precaution to prevent a repetition of Port Arthur. Notify the Navy. Port Arthur was the famous attack uh, by the Japanese, surprise attack on the Japanese-Russian fleet in 1904-5. But Sadler was overruled by higher authority, and the message, of course, never went, in spite of the fact that a member of the Army Security Agency, the agency that actually broke the Japanese uh, diplomatic code, the Purple Code. John B. Hurt wrote after the war that about midday on Saturday, December 6, 1941, we in the Army Security Agency knew that war was as certain as death. It was known in our agency that Japan would surely attack us in the early afternoon of the following day, not an iota of doubt. And of course, <clears throat> you have to have some understanding of what the magic is all about. This is the uh, code word for the secret American decoding of Japanese diplomatic and spy communications. Magic provided indications prior to the Pearl Harbor attack of the time, place, reason, and deceit plan to cover the Pearl Harbor attack. Hawaii didn't have any magic, but Washington, D.C., Manila, and the British, they did have magic. At any rate, we'll conclude this. Well, not quite. <clears throat> During the attack, Colonel Walter Phillips, General Shorts, Chief of Staff, telephonically reported the attack from Hawaii to General Marshall in Washington, D.C. Phillips reconstructed the conversation for the Joint Congressional Committee. His reconstruction was as follows. General Marshall, did you get my message? I sent you Saturday night. Phillips, no, what message? A radio I sent you last night. And, of course, Phillips didn't have any idea what he was talking about. Next, we have the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox. He went out to Hawaii almost immediately after the attack to conduct his own investigation. He arrived on December 11, 1941. His first question to Admiral Kimmel and several other officers out there was, did you receive my message Saturday night? And, of course, Kimmel replied, no, what message? I don't know what you're talking about. We didn't get any message Saturday night. Years later, 1973, James Stalin, a longtime friend from the newspaper business of the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, wrote to Admiral Kemp Talley. Admiral Talley <clears throat> was a key player in what they call the Three Small Ships Incident, where President Roosevelt personally directed the three small ships on December 1st, 1941, sail into the teeth of the Japanese fleet. At any rate, Tali uh, survived all of that and later wrote a book about it called Cruise of the Lanakai. Remarkably uh, interesting book. At any rate, uh, Stallman reported to Tali that he had been shocked by Marshall's statement that he couldn't remember where he had been the night before Pearl Harbor. 
but did remember his horseback ride at Fort Myer after he had sent the warning to Short and Kimmel by commercial cable. Frank Knox, whose nickname was the Colonel, told me that he, Stimson, Marshall, Betty Stark, and Harry Hopkins had spent most of the night before at the White House with President Roosevelt, Roosevelt, all waiting for what they knew was coming after those magic intercepts. Continuing on, Stallman wrote another letter in 1975 to a colleague of his, a professor at Vanderbilt University, in which he said pretty much the same thing, that the crew was waiting at the White House Saturday night, December 6th, expecting an attack somewhere by the Japanese. Interestingly enough, in an oral history project, <coughs> Admiral Smedberg was uh, interviewed. He had been one of seven naval aides to Admiral Stark. Admiral Smedberg, in his oral history, said Stark and Marshall agreed that some message should be sent to Kimmel and Short, and the Army agreed to send it. It never got out there until after the Pearl Harbor attack. And yet, it was the day before that the message was supposed to go. Nobody picked up on that rather remarkable comment, which is too bad. Okay. Here's the real story within the Pearl Harbor story, and I'm going to end it with this. Nine days after the Pearl Harbor attack, President Roosevelt selected a sitting Supreme Court Justice Owen Roberts to investigate the Army and the Navy only, and then only in Hawaii. Ten days after the Pearl Harbor attack, Admiral Kimmel and General Short were fired and replaced. Eleven days after the attack, Justice Roberts began his investigation, began his deliberations. He investigated for 36 days, 47 days after the Pearl Harbor attack. He filed a report, sent it to the President of the United States, unredacted, completely unchanged. The next day, he turned it over to the press, finding Admiral Kimmel and General Short solely responsible for the success of the Japanese attack and derelict in their duty. That was 47 days after the Pearl Harbor attack. End of the story. Soup to nuts. And that would have been the end of the story, but for this man, Captain Lawrence Safford, the head of Op20G, Naval Communications Intelligence, indeed the revered father of Naval Communications Intelligence. <clears throat> he thought Admiral Kimmel had been framed, and he so testified to the Joint Congressional Committee. He thought Kimmel originally should have been totally blamed because he thought Kimmel was receiving the magic messages, the vital information from the magic messages. But then he found out that that was not the case. So in order to determine what was true, he went to visit Admiral Kimmel living in disgrace in Bronxville, New York. Unannounced, Captain Safford, at great personal risk to himself, knocked on my grandfather's door. A, identified himself, and asked Admiral Kimmel, did you have available to you, Admiral, in Pearl Harbor, the same information we had available to us in the Office of Naval Intelligence in Washington, D.C., prior to the attack, indications of the attack from an intelligence program we codenamed MAGIC, which gave us, Admiral, prior to the attack, indications of the time, place, reason, and the sea plan to cover the attack. Did you have that information available to you? Admiral Kimmel, stunned, looked at Captain Safford and said, Captain, what in the world are you talking about? What is magic? Safford explained. Admiral Kimmel that very day turned into a fighting tiger. He got himself legal representation out of Boston. The junior attorney on that team, Ed Hanafy, took Safford's information and actually wrote the enabling legislation, which... He took to the Naval Affairs Committee. The Naval Affairs Committee was so impressed with what they uh, read, they took it to the full Congress, and the full Congress ordered the Army and the Navy to conduct further investigation, or there would have been no further investigation of Pearl Harbor 47 days after the attack. So the real story within the Pearl Harbor story was one man's 
determination to get the facts of the story to the American public. And that man was Admiral Kimmel, obviously needing Captain Safford's information, which, of course, was never designed to go public. So here's the real story within the Pearl Harbor story. The first investigation there, Secretary of the Navy Frank Knox's uh, investigation really is all you need to know. Knox found that neither General Short nor Admiral Kimmel at the time of the attack had any knowledge of the plain intimations of some surprise move made clear in Washington through the interception of Japanese instructions to Ambassador Nomura in which a surprise move of some kind was clearly indicated by the insistence upon the precise time of Nomura's reply to Secretary of State Cordell Hall at 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, December 7, 1941. Knox's report was known to Chairman Roberts, but not revealed to Kimmel and Short. Investigation number two listed there, the Roberts Commission. Here is the dark heart of the Roberts Commission matter. The Washington High Command falsely, falsely testified to the Roberts Commission that Kimmel and Short had the same magic information in Hawaii as they had in Washington, D.C. This false information was calculated to do and did Kimmel and Short irreparable prejudice. Investigation number three, Captain Safford revealed magic to the heart inquiry. Investigation number four, Admiral Kimmel indirectly revealed magic to the Army Pearl Harbor Board after General Marshall had committed and suborned perjury. Marshall was severely criticized by the Army Pearl Harbor Board. Investigation number five, the Naval Court of Inquiry virtually exonerated Kimmel and criticized his only uniformed boss, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Stark. Investigation six, seven, and eight, the Clark, Clouds, and Hewitt investigations tinkered at the margins. And investigation number nine, the last investigation conducted while Admiral Kimmel was still alive, the Joint Congressional Committee found no dereliction of duty. Okay, that's it, folks. I'm now ready for your questions. Thanks for your attention.